Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We worship you this morning. We exalt you, mighty God, creator of heaven and earth, our heavenly Father. On this Father's Day, Lord, we exalt you. That's what's most important. That's what's most important for any man, to be a true worshiper, a true follower of you, your word, to be a man of God, a man of righteousness in the days of evil and darkness. That's a real man. And Lord, I thank you there's real men in this room right here today, Lord, and watching us all the way to Denmark, Sweden, England, Brazil, everywhere. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for what you did on that cross for all of us. You died for our sins and rose from the dead. You paid the price. But it's up to us to choose, to choose who we will follow. And we will either follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, or we will follow after the lust of the flesh and the sins of this world and the lust of this world. We cannot have our one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. Lord, I pray that you will make this real to everyone today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. You know, I've been just so many things stirring in my, my heart, mind, of what I should speak to you this morning. That song right there, I didn't know my wife was going to pick that last song. It's an old song. That's going back to the... 90s there. In fact, it, what it brought back a memory to me, because uh, in the summer, in August of 2000, I went to the island of Mauritius. Anybody know where the island of Mauritius is? No. See, that's because I didn't know either when, uh, before I went there. Uh, it's a tiny little island about 1,500 miles or so east of South Africa. Uh, you go past Madagascar, and there's two little islands out there. One's called Reunion, and one's called Mauritius. And it's half of it's the island, the, the population goes like this mostly Hindu, about 51, 52% Hindu. Uh, a good chunk is Muslim, and then there's Christian. And, um, and when I went there, and the reason I'm bringing this up because uh, you know, on that island, they had temples. In fact, the pastor that invited me, and I stayed in his house, they, two doors down from his house was a temple to the Hindu god Kali, the goddess of destruction, right? And let me tell you something. When I got ready to go there, the elder in my church who actually God spoke to and paid for the whole trip, uh, he was attacked Tor actually collapsed his lung lifting something. And this guy was, you know, he was a former uh, Marine MP, right? This would mean when Marines got out of line, he got them back in line, right? All right? And he was a stout fella, and he had picked up something heavy and, he, and tore something in his lungs and collapsed his lung. In fact, he spent the whole weekend with a collapsed lung, and when they finally went to the doctor, he's like, how did you, how did you live his other lung should have collapsed, and then he should have been in serious trouble. But God had mercy on him. But I, I knew that that was a spiritual attack. That was a demonic attack because he had financed this whole, you know, outreach to the island of Mauritius. And we knew that it was a serious thing, that we were going into serious spiritual warfare. So we got the entire church, you know, praying. In fact, they were praying every time we were having a service in Mauritius, they were praying because we knew we were up against uh, some very powerful demon spirits and principalities. And I want to tell you, because of that, because we took it seriously, we understood that there's a spiritual war going on, and we had people praying and binding the demons, particularly that demon of Kali, there on the island, and this, the Muslim spirits. In fact, right before I got there, the Muslims had attacked uh, the Christians at one of the churches I was going to speak at there, and I actually went to speak at that church right after the Muslims had attacked that church and attacked some of the, the Christians there. So what I'm getting at is, is that you need to understand there's still, there's still Christians or people, especially in America, there's still people that think, well, they're Christians, but they have no concept 
whatsoever of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to walk in the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, and to discern the spirits that we're, we're operating against or the, when we dis, or to discern where somebody is really a brother or sister in the Lord. Now, I want to show you some stuff this morning, but I just want to get this in you that, you know, I, I've preached on this many times, and I'm just going to give you this quick rundown here. But Matthew 25, it talks about the parable of the ten virgins. And I've preached this many times, but there were five wise and five foolish. Now, what was the difference between the two? They were all virgins, which means they were all born-again Christians. They all had their lamps, which is the Word of God. The Bible says that clearly, that the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The only difference between the two, the, the wise and the foolish, is that the wise were full of the Holy Spirit. They had plenty of oil in their vessels, and they had the fire of the Holy Ghost in them. The others had let their oil run out. They let their fire go out. But folks, they were all virgins, and they all had their Bibles. These two things represent what we have in the church, and I want to make this as clear as I can today. You are either on fire, Holy Ghost-filled Christian that loves Jesus and that wants more of Jesus and more of the Holy Spirit and to walk in the supernatural, to walk in the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit, or you are a lukewarm, dead Christian. And I want to tell you right now, according to Revelations 3, if you are a lukewarm Christian, Jesus said he is going to vomit you out of his mouth. And what makes you lukewarm? I want to tell you right now, you don't pursue Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You don't pursue righteousness. You don't pursue being filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't pursue the gifts of the Spirit to work in your life. There's a lot of people that are going to be knocking on that door like the, the five foolish virgins saying, Lord, let us in. And he's going to say, I don't even know who you are. These are Christians. They're going to say, oh, well, mom and dad were Christians or granny and grandpa were Christians. And I went to church once in a while and I'm a Christian. But yet, you know what their idol is? They play video games 12 hours a day. Or they're still in sexual sin and immorality. They're still into pornography or premarital sex or adultery. And yet they call themselves a Christian. Or they're still in Freemasonry. Or they're playing with occult things like Ouija boards. Oh, but I'm a Christian. No, Jesus said, and you need to get this straight. Jesus said in, in Revelation 3, matter of fact, you can put it up. Revelation 3. He said, be hot or be cold, but if you are lukewarm, I am going to spew you out of my mouth. Hot or cold? Here's the thing. One of the things it says there, when you go to Revelation 3, I think. It starts at verse what? Yeah, back up a couple. We'll read the whole thing. Where he says, unto the church and unto the angel... Or the messenger, the pastor, the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Why, why does he say, I wish you were either cold or hot? Because if you're lukewarm, you are completely self-deceived. Because you think you're going to make it. You think, I'm a Christian. I got saved when I was nine years old, or I prayed a sinner's prayer, or I got baptized, or I used to sing in the choir, or I was in a youth group, all this stuff. Oh, I'm good. That's deception. There's a lot of deceived Christians. Because they have no heart to really, be, to really pursue the Lord. They have no heart to say, I want the gifts of the Holy Spirit working through me. I want God to completely take over my life so I can help people. Yeah. we got a bunch of Christians that still love the world but want to go to heaven. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you love the world and the things that are in the world and the lust in the world and the sin of the world, if that's what you love and that's what you keep your mind on, and that's what you constantly pursue. And you call yourself a Christian. I'm going to tell you right now, you are a foolish virgin. You have lost the oil, which is the Holy Spirit. You don't even have him with you. And you're going to find out when Jesus returns that you're not going in. And I want to tell you this verse right here. When Jesus goes on to say to this church, he's speaking to Christians. 
He said, let's go to the next one. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Keep going. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, you don't know, no it's not, you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He's telling a church, folks, full of Christians, you don't even know that you are blind. That you are naked. You are not clothed with the white robe of righteousness. You don't even know it. How many Christians are like that? I'm going to tell you right now. Millions. Especially in America. Let me tell you right now. If a, if a Christian, a person says they're a Christian and they're, they're, they're fine with the LGBTQ whatever agenda. Oh, let's just affirm all that nonsense. That sin, that wickedness. Oh, that, well, let's just be sweet. We just need to affirm that, that that's okay. You're, 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 you're gone, and you don't even realize that you're lukewarm. And notice what he says. Jesus says what the answer is to this being wretched and miserable, poor and blind and naked, spiritually speaking. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That means be willing to go through whatever it takes to let Jesus purify sin and wickedness out of your life, you get, you, you've got to become gold tried by fire. You're willing to take the persecution and the heat to stand up for what the Word of God says, biblical Christianity, walking with Jesus. And then he says, he says, buy me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. That's talking about spiritual, not physical riches. He says in white raiment or white clothing, that means you are clothing yourself with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and choosing to walk in that righteousness. Yes, Jesus makes us righteousness if we believe in him, but we have to continue to keep our robes clean without spot or wrinkle. And see, this is another Another sign of a lukewarm Christian is they don't really care that much about, they're not too upset about the sin in their life. Now, I'm not too upset about repentance and obeying the Lord and living holy. They're full of compromise. Full of compromise. I had to deal with it this week in this church. Because Jezebel got hold of one of our members and got seduced him. Oh, I ain't scared to say it. I'll call names in a second. He said, but we, we've, got to, we've got to be clothed with these robes of righteousness. And how many Christians? I'm telling you, I have Christians all the time. They're still in premarital sex, or they're still addicted every day to pornography, or they're still getting drunk on a regular basis, or they're committing adultery, if not committing the act, but constantly looking upon another who is not their spouse in lust. And Jesus said, if you look on a woman to lust after it, and actually the verb tense there is in a continual, ongoing way. If that's the way of your life, hey, listen, men, you want to be men of God? You best get control of your eyes and your thoughts if you're going to follow Jesus. Now, you can choose to say, I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to keep following after the world. And, th and if you sit back and go, wow, God just loves everybody and he's okay with that. No, 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 no. He says, I'm going to, these kind of folks that are lukewarm Christians, they will be spit out of my mouth. And if you think it, if it, you believe once saved, always saved, no matter how you live, or unconditional eternal security, or that nonsense that comes out of Calvinism or the Baptist church, if you believe that nonsense, you need to understand something. If you get spit out of Jesus' body, that means you were in it. And the only way to get in Jesus is to be born again through faith. So this means a born-again person that gets in the body of Christ, if they become lukewarm, they get spit out. There's no such thing as you're once saved, always saved, no matter how you live. This is the problem with the churches in America. Most of them believe and teach to, to, their, to their congregation and people that they're eternally secure no matter how they live. And Jesus just loves you no matter what you do. Now, He loves you, but that doesn't mean you're going to make it to heaven. Jesus loves everybody, but Jesus was clear. The road to heaven is a narrow road and few will make it. He said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction and many will go that way. Many. Somebody say many. many. 
So in comparison to the people who choose to walk in righteousness and walk in the true path of Jesus Christ and not be lukewarm, it will be few compared to the many who go the other way. And this is a choice. It's a choice every day you wake up and open your eyes. Who are you going to follow? I tell people all the time, I've preached it all the time, you're going to end up in the place eternally of the one you followed. And then people say, I'm following Jesus and they're steadily chasing after the devil stuff. That's lukewarm Christianity. Lukewarm Christians do not make it to heaven. They go to hell for eternity. And I know, oh, Pastor Dean, what, preaching this heaven and hell stuff, that's not popular. I don't care what's popular. The Word of God has not changed. The truth of the Word of God has not changed. It will never change. And these idiots out here thinking the Mandela effects changed the Word of God. I'm going to tell you right now, if you believe that, you're an idiot. And you are deceived. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The Word of God standeth sure. God said, I will preserve my Word to all generations. He said his word is forever settled in heaven. Isn't it amazing how many have tried to do, destroy this book and they can't get rid of it. Na Napoleon finally admitted. He said anybody who tries to get rid of the Bible is going to be destroyed. The word of God. This right here. This book. We have because the Holy Spirit moved through men to write it. You say, oh, these people say, they're Christians right now. Oh, it was just written by men. It's full of contradictions and errors. You are already deceived and on your way to hell. You don't even know the basic foundation of the faith if you start saying that. You've departed from the faith. That's a lukewarm Christian. Well, I just don't know. I don't know. There's parts of the Bible I like and there's parts I don't like. I, I, look, y'all, there'll be soon. I'm, I went down a rabbit hole last night. And I found one of these false prophets. I was like, Lord. But this guy is a complete, the guy that I'm looking into, complete, like new age false prophet. But yet, it's amazing. And he's been writing these books that he's been channeling from these demon spirits that he calls angels. But it's amazing because I, I started going through his books and reading passages. And I said, let me, let me just go on his website and type in Jesus. And I did. And, and I, it pulled up all the stuff he had to say about Jesus. And I thought, oh, but, but what was shocking to me is this guy doesn't even pretend to be a Christian, right? He's not a Christian at all. Yet some of his teachings seems to be in the Christian churches. Yeah. More than I even realized, like, wow, he's completely like a chance, a trance channeling medium for demons. That's how he writes his books. And yet, those very words that demons are giving him, I'm hearing come from pulpits across the country. Yeah. Beware, it's happening. The deception is happening. But Jesus tells him, look here, he says, that you may be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that you may see. That's what Jesus said. The anoint means the oil of the Holy Spirit. So you better get the Holy Spirit in your life to open your eyes to see what you need to see from the word of God, the truth about your own life and what you need to do. And also so you can have the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of God to help other people. I'm going to tell you right now, people that want to say I'm a Christian but deny the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit, they're deceived and they're only hurting themselves and everybody they could help. That's right. I want to show you something. Let's go. Whew, that was just the introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm fired up today for some reason. I don't know what it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You see, the sign of a true Christian, the sign of a Christian that's moving 
the way God wants them to move into the, we'll call it the hot realm. You want to be hot? Right? You want to be really, you know, the world, wants to you, you're hot. No, if you're wicked, you, you're cold. You're not hot. You want to be hot spiritually, you got to move in this direction. Now look at what he says here. We're going to start at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Most Christians, believe are still ignorant about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But listen to look, look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation, that means it working through you and being evident, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then he says this, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. Now, you know, look at that. Let me, let me help you with the King James English there. Dividing to every man severally means God's, God's plan and God's desire for his people is to get multiple, to operate in multiple of these nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say, that's God's will for me? I know the Baptist church talked you out of it. I know the Presbyterian church talked you out of it. I know the Lutheran church talked you out of it. The Church of Christ talked you out of it. The Nazarene church talked you out of it. All the voice of the devil. Because the word of God is clear. Paul said, I don't want you ignorant to these things. And then he goes on to say, let's go, let's, let's flip real quick to verse, I mean, chapter 14, verse 1. I'm going somewhere with this. We're just, we just passing by this, this spot for a minute. But notice what he says here. Follow after charity or love and action and, somebody say and. and. Desire. desire. I didn't hear you. Desire spiritual gifts. The word desire there means to earnestly lust after, to long for, to want in your life more than anything else. So let me, let me just propose a proposition to you right now. As a Christian, you are either lusting after the things of the world or you are lusting after the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit in your life. That you want to be close enough to Jesus you want to be walking in obedience and holiness so you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and these gifts can operate through you so you can help others, so other people will see that Jesus is in you. This is how we prove. Jesus said, look, put up Mark 16 real quick. Mark 16, 15 through 20. We're going to read it. This is normal Christianity that I'm about to read to you. Anything other than this is abnormal, weak, powerless Christianity. Here it is, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, true faith. This word believe doesn't just mean to have mental assent. There's a lot of people say, I believe in Jesus. But this word is different. This word in the Greek means to rely on, trust and cling to. That, that means Jesus is everything to you. You trust him, you love him. And it means to be continual in that type of faith, in that type of walk. But he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And this is not picking up snakes. This is serpents, demon spirits. They shall take up aero, means take authority over, suspend the activity of 
demon spirits. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Let's keep reading it. So then after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven. So this is when Jesus went up into heaven. He says, and he sat on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. See, this is what I want to tell you. The reason, the reason God poured out his spirit so much at Skyfall two weeks ago, Amen. and we saw people delivered from demons, I mean dramatically delivered from demons. Screams and growling and all kind of stuff was going on and demons were coming out of people. People were healed. But more than it, some people were so touched by the presence and power of God that they realized there's more to Christianity than just sitting in a pew once in a while or a chair. See, the, the thing about this is that any Christian... You don't have to be a five-fold apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, or an elder or a deacon. You can just, every, every Christian can have the fullness, the infilling, the overflowing of the gifts of the Holy Spirit so they can walk in power. Amen. Let me tell you, there ain't nothing better than to see somebody come up that's suicidal, ready to kill themselves, so depressed that they think there's no hope. And to lay your hands on them and cast the demons out of them in Jesus' name. And see their lives transformed. Amen. This is what the church is supposed to be. This is what the everyday Christian is supposed to be. These signs shall follow them that believe. He didn't say some of them. He said all of them. But the problem is, is that we got a bunch of people in the church that don't believe God's word anymore. And many never did from the start. They let somebody talk him out of it because he has a doctor of divinity. You better not let anybody talk you out of being full of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you're not hungry, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not hungry to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of, to, of the Spirit to operate through you, you are a lukewarm Christian. You're already deceived. You're already the foolish virgin. You have no oil. You have no fire. You can do nothing. And you do nothing. Some of these people, these Christians, do nothing but argue with other Christians. And they're powerless. They're weak. They're empty. The wise virgins had their vessels full of oil. They even had extra oil. And their lamp had fire in it. Now, let me, let me explain to you. Let me go back to the gifts of the Spirit for a second. If you remember, and you can put uh, 1 Corinthians 12 back up, and you put those gifts. There's nine of them. And they're not in this order, but you can actually put them in these three categories. All right? There's the revelation gifts. Somebody say revelation gifts. Revelation. What does revelation mean? That when God shows you something supernaturally that you have no ability, you would have no ability to know that or see that or understand that in the natural. Let me, let me tell you what they are. The word of knowledge is a revelation gift. I'll, I'll explain to how each one of these work in a second. The word of wisdom, okay? And then there's the discerning of spirits. Those three are the revelation gifts because they reveal something that's hidden. They reveal something in the spirit realm or something that God wants to show. Then you have the supernatural gifts that say something. All right? They are speaking prophecy, tongues, diverse kinds of tongues, and interpretation of those tongues. Those are saying something. Those are, are utterance gifts. Supernaturally, though, we all utter things. But this is meaning prophecy means a, an inspired supernatural utterance given you from God that you speak. Okay? Then there's the power gifts, the gift of healing, the gift of the working of miracles, and the gift of faith. Those are power gifts. Now let me show you, give you, give you an idea of the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is something that God reveals supernaturally to you about either the present, the present time, or the past. And then the word of wisdom is something that God reveals to you about the future 
about what either you should do or somebody should do about the will of God. I'll give you an example. I had a woman one time, and I've shared this many times, but we have new people all the time. But I had a woman come to, I pastored a church in Montgomery from 1995 to 2002. And somewhere around 2000, about the time I went to the island of Mauritius, this woman came in, never seen her before. She visited from Atlanta. And she had been saying in her heart, I didn't know this, she had been saying, where are the men of God who hear from God anymore? See, she'd been going to these churches that didn't even believe in this stuff, that had no supernatural oper operation, no gifts of the Holy Spirit. But she was hungry. Her, something in her was saying, I need more. I want more. If you've ever, you ever been bored with your Christianity, it's because you've been, you've been settling for where you are, for what you've got. There's always more. See, I'm, I'm 36 years into this, and I'm still hungry for more, brother. If your shadow's not healing the sick, there's room for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen? I want more. I want to be able to say one day, they lay the sick in the street and my shadow walk by because I'm so full of Jesus that people just start getting healed. And you say, well, that, just, that, that kind of stuff only happened in the Bible. No, Smith Wigglesworth, the apostle of faith, Back in the 1940s, visited San Francisco. He was an Englishman, but he was so full of the Holy Spirit. They actually laid the sick in the street, and as he walked by, his shadow healed the sick. The man raised 23 people from the dead through his ministry. Confirmed in front of thousands of people. Say, well, I never heard of him. Well, if you listen to the mainstream media, you're not going to hear a lot of things. <laughs> now, so this woman from Atlanta, she comes in our church. There, I give an altar call for Christians just that need to be refreshed. Here she comes. She comes, stands up there. And so I had about, probably about 10, 10 to 12 people that came forward. I'm going down the line praying for them. And like I shared with some of you the other day, I said, it's kind of hard. Sometimes the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate. And when I'm just standing here talking to you, sometimes I see and know what you're thinking. Because it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Cheetra knows that, right? Many times it's Cheetra thinking something and she'll say, Pastor Dean, you'll talk just about exactly what's going on in my head at that moment, right? And Jesus did that. He said Jesus knew their thoughts. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the word of knowledge. But this woman comes up and I go down to pray for her and I lay hands on her. And immediately I see a vision. Now, I had my eyes closed. I had my hands laid on her. And this is what I saw in my mind, like, like a dream almost. But you see it. You're awake. And I saw her standing in the aisle of a grocery store. And I saw her being afraid. And this is what I said to her. I said, I see you standing in the aisle of the grocery store and you're afraid. And then the Holy Spirit tells me to tell her to go ahead and talk to people about Jesus and don't be afraid. All right. She, I, I noticed I opened my eyes and tears run down her face. She hadn't said a word. So when I closed the service out, she comes up to me in tears, and she said, I just took a job this past week working in a grocery store aisle, you know, giving samples to people. And she said people would come up to me to get their sample, and I'd feel like I should talk to them about Jesus, but I was afraid. So see, what the Lord gave me, there was two gifts operating there, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom, because God revealed to me something that was happened in the past. She had already started working, and I saw her standing in that aisle, saw her being afraid. So that was a past event in her life. And then the Lord gave me a word of wisdom to tell her, yes, go ahead. Don't be afraid. Tell people about Jesus, even on your job. All right? And she was in tears. And what that did to her life was showed her that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are still real and today and in operation. Now, there's the other gift of the revealing, the discerning of spirits, and that's just when you have the ability by the Holy Spirit. You, can't, you don't control it. It happens when he moves upon you to know what spirit is operating in a person or a church or an organization or any given situation. God can show you if he is moving in that situation or in that person, or in that church, or if it's, a, if it's an evil spirit trying to deceive you and work through them. The discerning of spirits has operated in my life many times, many times. And it's something that 
You just, sometimes it'll come in a vision. Actually, the word discerning means to also to see or to perceive. And sometimes I will see. I've had people come in this church to actually do harm. Witches, Satanists will try to infiltrate, will try to come in. And they look, some of them look like sweet little grandmas. <laughs> and if you go by the outward appearance, you don't understand. You may have a very powerful evil witch that's come to try to do harm or sow division. Or just contaminate the atmosphere with her evil demons. And the Lord showed me at times, and this is Acts chapter 16. In fact, go to Acts chapter 16. I need to illustrate this. Acts 16. We got to hurry. It's Father's Day. Well, this is what, it, you know something about, listen, men, if, if y'all want a little Father's Day blurb, here it is. <laughs> you're supposed to lead your family because you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. You hear me? You're there to be the protector, spiritual protector, not just physical protector. But you're to be the spiritual protector of your family. A pastor is the spiritual protector of, his, of the church. But you're supposed to be the spiritual protector of your family. Listen, you're supposed to let no, nothing demonic come in your house. And some of you, it's coming through you because you're allowing it. And boy, what you men allow will go to your wife, will go to your children, will go to your grandchildren. But you can rise up and put a stop to it. Because let me tell you, discerning of spirits has nothing to do with what you see on the outside. You have to be in touch with the Holy Spirit to see beyond the natural. See, let, let's go to Acts 16. Go down to... Somebody say, this is good. We're getting the Word of God. Go down to verse 11. No, where are we? Well, this is good stuff here, too. Let me, let's just read... Oh... Oh, there's so much I want to go to here. Uh, listen, I, I tell you, we'll just read from verse 16. We'll read there. I, I mean, this, the, all, this whole chapter is amazing because Paul's trying to go. I'll say this first part. He tries to go into one place to preach, and he can't go there. He tries to go to another place to preach. And, and let me tell you, he, he, the Holy Spirit told him, no, don't go to either place. Now, think about that. You already have the word, go preach the gospel in all the world, right? Go everywhere. But the, he tries to go in one place. Holy Spirit says, nope. He tries to go over here. Nope. Paul got frustrated. The whole group got frustrated. They just said, we're going, to, we're going to camp right here, go to sleep, and tell the Lord. Shows what to do. So that night, Paul has a dream. Man from Macedonia, come over here and help us. See, sometimes the, that was a word of wisdom. Because they needed wisdom to know where the Holy Spirit wanted them to go. The will of God for that time, that moment. And it came in a dream, a vision at night. And you have to be able to discern that. But this one right here. Acts, it just, they go into Philippi, which is the chief city of Macedonia. It says, and it came to pass, as he went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her master much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, these men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul being grieved, that means in his spirit, was heavy and disturbed. And some of you need to learn how to discern things. Sometimes it's just in your spirit you will feel uneasy, heavy, disturbed. And when you get that warning in your spirit, you need to listen to it. Can somebody say amen? amen. Every time I've gone against that, I have made a mistake. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and unto the rulers. And, of course, you know the rest. They were beaten and thrown in prison. All right. But here's, here's my point. Notice what she said. This woman who had a spirit of divination Somebody that's possessed with a spirit of witchcraft or divination, or sometimes it's whoredoms, lust, perversion, whatever, you don't see the spirit 
Unless, again, the discerning of spirits. You, so this is why I said she went with them many days. Paul, Paul didn't see it at first because he's just looking at the outside. And, and what she was saying was true. These men are servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. So her words were correct. And it looked like she wanted to be with them and hang out with them. So everything looked sweet and kosher, didn't it? But it wasn't. And finally, in Paul's spirit, the Holy Spirit began to stir and say, no, no, no. She's operating in an evil spirit. And, she's, and really what it was, why was she there? She was there not to get saved, but to contaminate the atmosphere with her evil spirit. And probably to infiltrate a new church being planted so she could start laying hands on people and transferring demons to people. Contamination, spiritual contamination is what she was going to be doing. And Paul said, oh, no, no. And see, when Paul cast the demons out of her, you, this is really the only time you ever see them ever casting demons out of somebody that was clearly not saved. But the purpose was it so she couldn't operate in that anymore. And it was to expose her publicly. Somebody say, publicly. Oh, I've exposed some people. I, I'm going to tell you what, witches ought to get tired of trying to come in here. They ought to tell their friends, don't try Fire and Grace Church. Because they're going to figure it out, and you're going to be cast out. And boy, we have. You say, Pastor Dean, you're just so mean. No, I'm, I'm not playing little games. My job is to discern what's going on, not just on the outside, but what's going on in the spirit. But let me tell you right now, God wants every Christian to walk in that level of discernment or discerning of spirits. Amen. Because people's going to come into your lives, and you, you let them into your home, or you let them keep your children, and they look all sweet on the outside, and then you find out that they've molested your children. You better have some discernment. Oh, it got quiet in here. It got quiet as a Lutheran church for a second. Boy, I tell you, we better be careful who you hand your children off to. See, I've had, I've had the Holy Spirit show me in the spirit of pedophiles. Listen, pedophiles look just like everybody else. But they got a secret. And you better have discerning of spirits before you hand your ch children off to somebody. I said, you know what? In our house, there's been a rule. Ain't no spending the night over at somebody else's house that we don't really know that well. The fact of the matter is, I don't think we even do it with people that we know that well. Because the point is, almost all, all the, 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 the crap I got into was spending the night at somebody else's house. In fact, we, you know, I tell my parents I'm spending the night at somebody's house, and they tell their parents they're spending the night at my house, and we just be out all night. And I'm talking about at 12 years old. Yeah. Discerning of spirits sees in the spirit realm. It perceives. You've got to figure out, look, go to put up 2 Corinthians 11. Oh, we're getting somewhere today. 2 Corinthians 11. This is why it's important, folks. You, you don't want somebody infiltrating your family. You don't want somebody evil infiltrating your church. You don't want somebody evil. If you're having a Bible study, you've got to protect that. That's right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me get to it. Go down to verse... 13, Paul had to warn them, and he says here, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He says, and no marvel, or don't be surprised, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Paul tells us that even Satan will transform himself to appear as an angel of light that you got to beware and he says his ministers the people that work for him satanist witches devil worshipers secret society people will pretend to be on the outside ministers of jesus christ how do you know let me tell you right now, I've had pastors, 
pastors of churches that I'd go into church and I'd go, something feels wrong here. How many years ago, God had me in a church and I'm like, the pastor, I had never seen anybody that could preach 15 million sermons in one hour. It was the most confusing, jumbled up mess I'd ever seen in my life. And he'd always say, you know, it's okay to chase some rabbits if you bring the meat home. I'd be like, you aren't bringing any meat home. You're just chasing everything that runs by you. But he was a deceiver. And I could come out of a 21-day fast. And God had sent me there. And God began to show me. First thing he showed me was that he was a false apostle. Then I had, I began to discern it in the spirit that his wife was a Jezebel. She had a Jezebel spirit on her strong. Talk about that all day long. And then he began to show me even the elders in the church. I saw a vision of them committing adultery with women in the church. And then God begins to show me all this stuff in the spirit. And then the associate pastor comes in one day and puts his arm around me and says, very serious manner death curse i was like you people are unreal but god put me there god gave me a dream of this man and, and this being up on this well i was up on this high wall in it like concrete blocks and it was like 10 stories high and i'm on top of it and the thing's teetering like there's no mortar it's nothing holding it together and finally it falls and the hand of the lord catches me and sets me down on the ground and then the Lord told me, I woke up and the Lord told me, turn to Ezekiel 13. He said, and in Ezekiel 13, he says, the false prophets have built a wall with untempered mortar and that wall will fall. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you go tell that prophet of Baal that this phony fake church he's built, this, this wall he's built is going to fall. And so I go back and tell him, the prophets built on a Wednesday night in front of everybody. Prophetic word. Prophet of Baal, that your wall will fall. God's going to put it in. To, and God ended that church because it was a facade. It was fake. But all of that was walking in the spirit. I had laid hands. I, had, I was in that church for about two months. God had me, and I'd laid hands on a woman, praying for her at the altar, and he showed me she was a witch, that she was a Satanist, that she was playing, pretended to be a Christian. Well, she happened to go to a church in Birmingham, and I knew the pastor at the time. This is back in the late 80s, early 90s. And I knew the pastor there. I actually good friends with him. And she goes to the, his church and, and then gets, uh, what did you call it, Jordan? Cupcaked up with the, uh, with the, with the, guy, with the guy that uh, was leading the main Bible study in the church. And she seduced him into sexual immorality. And then she starts sowing her little false teachings to the people in his Bible study. And when I heard about it, I called the pastor and actually went and had dinner with him and said, look, this woman, God showed me this woman's a witch. She's here to divide your church. He wouldn't listen. Because, see, he was looking on the outside. Oh, she says, because she teaches some good stuff. I said, she's going to destroy your church. And she destroyed it because he didn't listen. In fact, there was, a, there was a youth pastor at a big church in Montgomery. Again, I was very close to the, uh, everybody in this church because I had actually had led the singles ministry in the church, Assembly of God Church in Montgomery. And the youth pastor had a couple of Satanists that had come into the youth group, infiltrated the youth group, pretending to be Christians. And what I found out, I was like, and they were powerful people because I, I, I had had dealings with them already i knew what coven they were in i knew who trained them and that in that youth pastor you know he he was he he actually got up and preached making fun of me one day see and i was like i was like well you about to have your whole little world torn to pieces by these these high level satanists because you have no discernment i told him so you have no discernment whatsoever I even told him, you have no business even 
leading a youth group. Because let me tell you, the, the, the main important thing, if you want to know, men, leadership, leadership can see beyond the natural. That's the key to leadership. Christian leadership is being able to see. But that's because the only way you're going to see is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be hungry for the gifts, these gifts of the Holy Spirit to be in your life. You know, we see the gift, let's say the gift of the word of knowledge of Jesus, the woman at the well. John chapter 4, Jesus walks up to the woman at the well, and they start having this conversation about living water, right? And Jesus all of a sudden tells her, go get your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And this is when the word of knowledge kicked in. You want the word of knowledge? Jesus, now, remember, Jesus, God in the flesh, chose to operate as a man anointed of the Holy Spirit because he wanted to teach us. He said, you know what? Word of knowledge, gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, you're correct. Said, You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Changed her whole life. She said, I, we know Messiah's coming. She said, I'm the, I'm the one speaking to you. I am he. She was like, Went into the city, told everybody she was, she was transformed. And this is exactly what we get. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians. Back to, back to 1 Corinthians 14. This is what I love. Come on, somebody say, I love the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Do you? Some of you love TV shows and movies more than that. Because uh, that's what you spend your time doing. Uh-oh. Because let me tell you, if you want to be filled and flow and operate in the, and be led by the Holy Spirit and operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you've got to spend time in prayer. You've got to spend time in the Word. You've got to spend time fasting. You've got to spend time with the Lord. He has to be number one. You can't be a lukewarm Christian and think you're going to have your foot doing worldly stuff and living in sin and then go to church once in a while and this be real in your life. It's not going to be. First Corinthians 14 Go down to verse, oh, goodness. Oh, we'll just read verse 21. We'll start there. Paul was talking about the gift of tongues. And, and, and nowhere in here does he, he discourage the gift of tongues. He just said in a public service, there's a way that they're supposed to operate. He says it, people can speak in tongues one, two, or by, by three at the most, and there'll be interpretation. That's the only restriction. Nowhere does he say it's not for today. Nowhere does he say you shouldn't speak in tongues or the gift of tongues shouldn't operate in your life. In fact, it's more for your personal life to help you in prayer, to help you in your worship time, to help you learn how to hear the voice of the Lord. But he says right here, verse 21, In the law it is written, With the men of other tongues and of lips I will speak unto this people, and yet for all they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serves not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So he's saying he's just showing that primarily, not that it won't be. But he says, if therefore the whole church be to come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those unlearned or unbelievers. Notice he said everybody's speaking in tongues. He said, well, you're not, will they not say you're mad? But if all prophesy, again, speaking supernaturally by the Holy Spirit, there'll come in one that believeth not, or one is unlearned, and he is convinced of all, and he is judged of all. And thus, look at the verse 25. Thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. The secrets of people's hearts can be, this is the word of knowledge. Oh, how important is this? Uh, I don't know, there was, a, there was months back, maybe a year ago, I think it was one of Wanda's friends, came, sitting right where you sit. And after the service, we were praying. Some people came forward. I was praying for some people. And she didn't even get out of her seat for prayer. But I felt like I was supposed to pray for her. And I went over to lay hands on her. And I said, the Lord just spoke to me. He said, things, things are about to greatly change in your life. There's a big change coming. Move is coming. She didn't even realize. But it was like the next week. I don't even know what happened. But all the circumstances of her life changed. And she had to move immediately. And she told Wanda, she said, my God, was that ever a word from the Lord? 
But see, what did that do? It's not, not to build faith in me. It's so that she knows God is working in her life. And that that does is encourage her and strengthen her walk and her faith with the Lord. That's what the Bible talks about. Prophecy is brings edification to people. It's encouraging. It's strengthening. But it's, it's supernatural revealing of their hearts. How many of you want, just like Jesus, you want to talk about an evangelism tool? Be able to, to reveal the secrets of people's hearts. I've told y'all before, I was witnessing in Eureka Springs, Arkansas in 1987. I walked through a little park in that town, in that town of about 3,000 people, 1,500 people were in the satanic coven there. How do I know? Because I led one of their top witches to the Lord and she told me everything. So I, I'm sitting down on the bench with a, a girl I've never seen before. And I start talking to her about Jesus. And no response, just dead face, looking down at the ground. She looked like the most depressed person I'd ever seen. And I saw a car drive by, and it was like full of like young people, and you could just hear them talking and chattering on. But immediately, I saw her eyes look at them, and it was like, I don't know what, why that triggered it, but it's like the Lord played a whole movie in front of me. And I saw she was in the satanic coven, that those young people were in it too, but that she was terrified and wanted out, but she didn't know how to get out. Because she knew the devil has power and these people are all around me. And if I try to get out, then they kill me because they've done it to others in front of her. And I start telling her, you are in the coven. You're a witch. But you want out, but you're afraid to get out. I said, there's only one way out in that you live. I said, you've got to turn your life over to Jesus all the way. 100%. There can be no halfway measures here or they will kill you. I said, but if you get out through Jesus Christ, he will protect you. He is more powerful than the devil. I said, they've tried to, I said, your same little group has tried to kill me several times and they have failed. And I'm, t I'm saying she never said a word. The tears were just pouring down her face. She didn't have to say anything. But she knew the secrets of her heart had been revealed. And that let her know Jesus is real. This preacher didn't just come to me with words, but he came to me with some power. And let me tell you right there, that I was 19 years old. I wasn't a pastor yet. I hadn't even hardly studied the Bible yet. I had just been filled with the Holy Spirit. I had repented of my sins and I had gotten on fire for Jesus only a few weeks earlier. So it isn't about, oh, that's for pastor to do. No, it's for you to do. You're to be like Jesus. And Jesus revealed the secrets of men and women's hearts supernaturally because He was operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what your Christianity is supposed to be. And if it's not, you have dead Christianity. Let me show you something about dead Christianity, what it says we're supposed to do. If you're in dead Christianity, you better run from it. Go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 3. Oh, this is some people for some people right here. See, I'm still rebelling against that email. I'm drinking water. <laughs> I'm a rebel. <laughs> here we go. Now, I'm going to read from verse 1 because this is in the context particularly of, of a, this is a last days in time prophecy that we're living in. We're living in the last days of the last days. Paul said this, know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, having no sexual control in their life, self-control, fierce, despisers, boy, this one right here, so despisers of those that are good. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Traitors, heady, high-minded. Here we go. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasures. I'm going to tell you, entertainment. 
If you spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of watching Netflix or whatever else is the new thing, you spend hours and hours and hours playing video games, you spend hours and hours and hours reading romance novels, or you spend hours and hours and hours watching pornography, you are a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God, Christian. And he says about these, he says, these people, the, all this list, everybody think that's the wicked. No, he, these are Christians living like this. And he says, clearly, having a form of godliness, an outward appearance of Christianity, because the only true godliness is through Jesus Christ. And he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Folks, if you go, the command of the Bible is if you go to a church and there's no gifts of the Holy Spirit, there's no power of the Holy Spirit demonstrated, there's no casting out demons, there's no speaking in tongues, there's no prophesying, there's no visions, there's no dreams, there's nobody getting healed, run from that place! They have nothing to offer you. You say, well, pastor, I got saved in that church. Thank God you got saved because of Jesus and the Holy Spirit working on you in spite of that place. Any place that denies, rejects the Holy Spirit, the gifts and power of the Holy Spirit, they are deceived and the Holy Spirit is quenched and grieved and moves away from that place. Look, I know, I know of situations where, where people have been arrested and put in a, you know, because they're out drunk in public, right? And they end up in a drunk tank in the jail with a bunch of other drunks that are still drunk that evening. And there's been drunks who are Christians living in sin, start talking about Jesus in the drunk tank, and somebody gets saved. Does that mean we should stay in the drunk tank? Just because somebody got saved in the drunk tank, that's my church. Drunk tank church. I'm going to be honest. I'm being real hard on this Baptist nonsense. I was Baptist. I know exactly what they preach. I know exactly what they teach. I know exactly what happens there. And if I'd have stayed there, I would have never, ever grown in my faith and begun to operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Never would have. Because they wouldn't have allowed it anyway. They would have kicked me out. I would have got the left foot of fellowship instead of the right hand of fellowship. <laughs> and it's sad that most Christians live their Christian life in such ignorance because they trust their pastor and don't read their Bibles. And the pastors, most of the pastors, folks, are keeping things from you instead of telling you the whole counsel of God's word. He says, I'm going to read this again. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. The word power, in, in the Greek New Testament, there's only two words for power in the Greek. There's exousia and dunamis. Exousia is the authority. All right, and I'll explain it like this. And dunamis is the supernatural power. Authority would be this. When you look at a policeman, like you, you're flying down the road and you see the police officer, and you all of a sudden your heart, <clears throat> and so you start slowing down, that's not because he's got a roadblock there and you're going to, you know, a concrete wall and you're going to smash into it. What happened is your heart had a moment of encounter with authority. See, the authority, you recognize, he has the authority to write me a big fat ticket. So his badge, his uniform, his position has authority. But the gun he carries is the power to back it up. You hear me? And in Jesus, if you're born again, you get authority. Because we're, we become born again. You have both authority and power if you have the Holy Spirit. And what he says here is there are Christians who have the outward form of godly Christianity, but they deny, reject, disavow. If you look up the word deny there, it means to disavow, to reject the dunamis miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. That's the Strong's definition of dunamis, the word there, power. The miraculous supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, you're supposed to be a supernatural Christian. 
Can I just go and tell you? And if not, you're either a baby still, and you're letting a church or a denomination keep you a baby, or you're lukewarm. But if you grow up into him, you're going to grow up into Jesus operating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You know, I tell this many times. I mean, Pastor Troy, I got testimonies. They came, Pastor Troy laid hands on people at the, at the conference and God healed them or delivered them. Mary Lou, Eddie, Bobby and Terry back here. Supernatural things. Sal. Sal cast demons, Roman Catholic demons out of a woman and a long demonic red tongue came out of her mouth. Say, so, oh, I ain't seen any of that. <laughs> well, you hadn't seen a million dollars cash sitting in your living room either. That doesn't mean they don't exist. Well, I've seen some crazy things. I've seen people, I I walked into a room one time, and a guy turned to me and said, you've been here before. I've never seen the guy before in my life. It's demons talking to him. You've been here before. He was sitting in a chair. I kid you not. I walked over and rebuked the demons in him in Jesus' name, and he flew to where you are in the air, and I didn't touch him. And he's laying on the floor growling and spitting and foaming at the mouth. So I don't want to see any of that, Pastor Dean. Trust me, you do. Because you know what? That's normal Christianity. We're to do, Jesus said the works that he did, we are to do also. Let's put that verse up. John, the gospel of John 14, 12. Jesus said this to his disciples and we are his disciples. He said, the works that I do shall ye do also in greater works than these because I go into my Father. He that believeth on me. Look at that. Did he give any condition? He said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go into my Father. You know why he said greater works? It's not that if we do a miracle in Jesus' name. Jesus raised the dead. The blind could see. All these great miracles. But he only did them for three years. I've been seeing them, see God doing stuff like that for 36 years. Folks, I've seen the crippled walk. Chitra's dad was here in his trip before. He he was blind in one eye. I told him, God's going to heal your eye. Your eye's going to be fine. He's seeing through that eye now. And he's not even all the way in yet. He's still got one foot in trying to follow Jesus and one still in Hinduism. He's just struggling. But God loves him, and God's working on his heart. God's brought him a long way already. But look at that. Blind eye can see now. And I don't, I don't guess I shared the testimony last time. I'm going to show you the testimony that happened at Skyfall. There was, a, there was a, a couple, young couple, that came from Florida and brought their mother. The, the, the daughter was just in tears. She said, I got younger siblings, and my mom's about to die. She said, my mom's been, a, been an addict for years. And drinks every day. And they said, we brought her. She is a skeleton. She was a skeleton. Even just even spots on her face they, all, they thought were cancerous. And they had brought her Friday night. They brought her in. And somehow, I didn't even see her. I prayed for the daughter. But I believe it was because God wanted her the next night. You know, God just has his ways about doing things. So they, they took her home after Friday night. No, back, well, I say home, back to the hotel room. And she was so weak and so sick that she couldn't even get up out of bed. And she said, then they come on Saturday and they start telling me, can you go to the hotel and pray for her? Well, that morning in our first worship session, the Holy Spirit told me, I'm going to heal people tonight. It was so strong. The Holy Spirit came all over me. He, I heard him clear as about I'm going to heal people tonight. And so I said, I told him, I said, look, do everything you can to get her here tonight, if you have to carry her in. If, you, if she can't make it in, I said, I will go to the hotel and pray for her, but I believe she's supposed to be here tonight. Now, this is just two weeks ago, Skyfall Conference, Saturday night. So I give the altar call. Remember, I give the altar call for the people that had, had either had abortions or caused them, men that had caused abortions, to come over here and get 
deal with that and get deliverance. Then I had people in the middle come up and get prayed for for healing. And then I had another group of people come up on this side that felt like they needed to still had a demonic stronghold they need deliverance for. Power of God's moving. Start praying for people. I don't know how many came to the altar. It was probably 100. I don't know. And the daughter came to get me. She said, she's back here. So I went back toward the back. She's actually laying down across the seats because she can't sit up. She has no strength. She could barely talk to me. I mean, this woman's at the point of death. And I, I leaned over. I said, well, actually sat down on the floor between the chairs. And I said, do you believe Jesus can heal you and set you free? She said, yes, I do. And I looked at her, her daughter and her son-in-law and the other couple that had brought her. And I said, I said, I'm going to cast the demons of the spirit of addiction and the spirit of death out of her right now. And so I laid hands on her, across her, and I said, I just said, in the name of Jesus, I bind the demon spirits of addiction. I bind the demon spirits of death. I bind you in Jesus' name, and I command you to leave her now. And when I did, the screams that came out of her, you could hear the screams all across the whole conference center. And I knew immediately they had left. And then I heard the, the Lord, and I, and I saw in my, my, my mind, the Lord gave me this. I saw the word arise in my mind, like in the, in the sky, in sunshine. And the Lord said, tell her to arise up healed. And I said, the Lord said to tell you to arise up healed in Jesus' name. And I am not kidding you. She popped up like a jack-in-the-box. She sat straight up like somebody had lifted her up. Her face, her skin, her countenance had all changed. I said, so can you stand up with me? Stood straight up. Boom. I took her by the hand and said, can you walk with me? We told her we walked way down the aisle. And then I turned around and said, can you walk back by yourself? Took off and left me. She went back and sat down by her family, her daughter's boohooing because she knows her mom is about to die and she's got all these younger siblings. It's just going to be a tragedy. And her mom says, I feel like I could run a marathon. <laughs> now, why would any Christian be against that? Oh, we can't do it. We can't cast out demons, heal the sick. Why would any Christian say no to that? They called me after Skyfall into the, the next week after, and they said even the, 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 the places on our skin they thought were cancer were disappearing. But you know, I'll give you this. The Lord told me also when she went back and sat down, I walked back over there and this was the word of the Lord to her. It said, go and sin no more lest the worst thing come upon you. Your days of alcohol and drugs are over. No more. You go back no more or a worse thing will come upon you. This is Christianity, folks. This is Christianity. Walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Healing the sick. Casting out demons, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, the gift of prophecy, discerning of spirits. Yes. This is Christianity. And if your church says these things aren't for today, or they're done away with, or they stopped after the first century, or they stopped after the Bible was done, that is a lie, a satanic lie. And you should flee from that. Say, Pastor Dean, you're just hurting all kinds of people's feelings. I don't care. Because you know what God wants you to do? Get beyond your feelings. Get beyond the traditions and doctrines of men. Stop being loyal to a denomination instead of being loyal to the Word of God and to the truth of God and to what God wants you to do. All of you can have and walk in this kind of power and gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can, but you've got to hunger for it. You've got to want it with everything in your being. You've got to be willing to do what's necessary to have it. And you can't be a lukewarm Christian and think you're going to walk in it. It's not going to happen. A lot of people think, oh, well, you know, Christians that don't want to live a holy life, don't want to obey God, want to just live in sin. And they'll go, That's, you know, I don't know about that fire grace church over there. They're kind of weird. Well, you're kind of dead. The only reason, the only reason this stuff sounds weird to you is because you've been taught wrong your whole life. It's sad. 
I think about Terry back there. Terry, Terry could not stand me, didn't want to hear my voice. Bobby would play my sermons at their house. I, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> she was Baptist to the bone or what? Church of Christ, the same doctrine, basically. Church of Christ, to the bone, just like, uh uh-uh. He's too mean. That's what she said. He's too mean. He believes some weird things. I don't believe anything but what's in the Word of God, what's in the Bible. Amen? I just happen to believe all of it. But Bobby kept on praying for her, kept on playing those sermons. And she started leaning in a little bit when they were playing. Now, she's baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of speaking in other tongues. Hearing from the Lord, just graduated from our ministry school, was on the prayer team praying for people and seeing miracles, seeing people, you know, leading people to Jesus. Now, let me ask you something. Isn't what you experience now better than the religion you had before? Amen. Somebody say amen right there. Give the Lord praise right there. I don't want dead religion. God loved those people. I mean, I'm not trying to be mean. I know people don't, most people just don't know. They don't know any better. And that's why it's so important to read the Bible for yourself. Don't let anybody talk you out of everything that's in there. See, that's when when I was 19, I, I started reading it and I refused. After I read it, that was it. I didn't care if you had a, a PhD, a THD, a DD, a D, divinity. Yeah, these are all real degrees. <laughs> I didn't care about any of that. You couldn't talk me out of it. It's, it's like somebody, I, 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 you know, I love me a good, like, thick, you know, ribeye or porterhouse. Just got to be good and thick, right? Season like, you know, nobody can beat my steaks, right? That's what my wife says. She won't even eat steaks out because she only wants mine, all right? And I love those steaks. And it'd be like, you know, I've had a few. And somebody trying to walk up to me and going, you know, you really shouldn't eat a steak. Not good for you. What? <laughs> you know, they're terrible for you. And they're just all this stuff. I just be like, no. No, you're too late. I've already experienced it for myself for a number of years. You're not talking me out of it. <laughs> there ain't a person on this earth that could talk me out of it. So he said, you should take vitamins. See, I, did, I love this. It's one of these movies I saw a long time ago. He says, you told this old man you should take a vitamin. He said, I'd take one every day. It's called a steak. <laughs> but you can't talk me out of it. It's like sweet tea. He ain't never going to talk me out of it. <laughs> My nickname for sweet tea is country boy go juice. And I already drank some of it. I saw a video, I think Faith pulled it up, the, the first, or maybe Nancy did. These, these English, these kids like in junior high, these in Britain, they never had sweet tea before. They gave them sweet tea, like ice cold sweet tea. They were like, my, this is quite good. This is quite, no- quite, quite nice. <laughs> and then they just guzzled it down and said, could I get some more of that? <laughs> See, that's the way the Holy Spirit is to me. You know that script, scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, Amen. On. I've already tasted yes. the presence, the power, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Your theology, your dead theology is not going to talk me out of it. And I refuse to be a lukewarm Christian. Can I tell you right now, I don't care what you are, what age you are, what background you have, what race you are. The destiny of God upon your life is to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to operate in the gifts and the power of the Holy Ghost, and to set people free. So I don't know what to do with my life. That's what you should do with your life. And if you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're hungry for Him and you want to live holy and obedient and Lord, I just want to do Your will and I want the power of the gifts to work through me, He will satisfy that hunger. That's why I love people who say whatever they want to say about Greg Locke. You want to talk about somebody staunch Baptist. Preach the gifts ceased. As Baptist as Baptist could get. And God began to deal with him because a little nine-year-old girl manifested demons in the baptistry and he had to turn his head and walk away. And I love what his wife said. You know, he preached it Friday night there. His wife said, got home that night. Thank God for godly women. He ain't afraid to say something. He said, shame on us. 
Shame on us. We got a big church, but we don't have enough power to set a nine-year-old girl free from demons. Shame on us. And if you ain't never set somebody free from demons as a Christian, shame on you. Because Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe. And the first thing he said was, you shall cast out devils. I think about Greg Locke saying, you know what? Crying tears down his face and saying, I got I to gotta get back in the word. And he, he got back in the word with not, he took off the Baptist filter. And he got back in the word and you know what he found out? All oh, this is still for us today. And then he got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then he started having deliverance services. And then people started getting healed in his church. He finally found his destiny. Guess what? It wasn't to be a Baptist preacher. It was to be a man of God filled with the Holy Spirit and to operate in the power of God. So the question you need to ask yourself today, am I lukewarm? And it's easy to know. If you're not hungry for more of God, more of Jesus, more of His Holy Spirit, more of His power, if you don't desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you don't desire to live holy life, you are lukewarm. Maybe you're not even saved. But you're lukewarm at best. And if you're in these dead churches, you need to leave them and find a church that's on fire with the Holy Spirit, fire of God's working through them, and people are getting set free from demons, and they're getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues, and they're beginning to see prophecy and the interpretation of tongues. I was awesome, Cherie, in just the last, what, year or so, maybe a little longer? She's been in our church from the beginning, her and Patrick. But just recently, still, still staying hungry, started operating the gift of interpretation of tongues And even that, with that right there, you know, sometimes God moves on, on Patrick to give a, t a public tongue, and then now he gives his wife the interpretation of tongues. How awesome is that? They didn't plan that. That just happened by it's God. But see, that's what even now, even if you start operating in the gifts, you don't get satisfied. Because I want to see more of the gift of healing. The gift of working the miracles. Whew. Somebody say, amen. amen. Listen, I, 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 before we close, I want to say one last thing. I just want to tell you this. I know. If somebody bring me a polluted church book, would you grab one, Craig? I know better than most because I've been in this Pentecostal charismatic thing for a long time. That's why God had me write this book, The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City. Why did God make me write this church in two, um, write this book rather in 2011 about the pollution in the church? And, the, and in particularly, what I'm doing in this book for over 200 pages is dealing with the counterfeit supernatural. I'm dealing with the counterfeit gifts where Satan has gotten into these Pentecostal and charismatic churches and brought in demonic counterfeits and deception and I name names like Bethel like IHOP of Kansas City Mike Bickle and them I know people that know Mike Bickle I know people that know Bill Johnson about I know people that are good friends with him I don't doubt I'm not saying these men don't love Jesus but they have opened the door through contemplative mysticism and different things and letting false prophets and witches run and uh, do whatever they want to do. And their ministries have become polluted and they are deceived and they're walking in a lot of false doctrine and counterfeit manifestations of the supernatural, demonic stuff that they're pretending to be the Holy Spirit. So don't get me wrong. There's counterfeits. There's churches that will preach what I preach and they're operating in the false. That's why. You have to be able to discern the difference. You hear me? But if you want to know, I mean, most people want to get my book, Grace Abuse, about once saved, always saved, and dealing with that false doctrine, or they want to get like Clay, dealing with biblical creation. This one just kind of gets overlooked. But to me, 
This is probably one of the most important things. If you want to be a spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-led Christian, you need to read it. I give away more than I sell, so it ain't about I ain't trying to sell a book. It's just I want to tell you, I've walked through this. I've been to Kenneth Hagin meetings. I've been to Benny Hinn meetings. I was at the Brownsville Revival. I've been into meetings with leaders from the Toronto Revival. I've been sat and had hands laid on me with leaders of the Argentine Revival. Carlos Anaconia, Claudio Fritzen, Pastor Hector. Those guys from the Argentine Revival have all prayed for me. I've been around this stuff. I was at Larry Lee's church. So God has enabled me to see a lot of stuff over 36 years. And I've seen the good, the real, Holy Spirit, gifts, and power, and miracles, and I've seen devils counterfeit. But don't let, because, look, I tell people this all the time. Not long ago, I think we got a counterfeit. Somebody gave a counterfeit $100 bill. They didn't know it was counterfeit. And sometimes, if you don't look at it closely, you can just go on ahead and, you know, spend it and get a visit from the Secret Service. But it happens sometimes. Right? We've, it, several times, actually, we've had counterfeit bills. But let me tell you, just because I got a counterfeit $100 bill one time and a counterfeit 50 one time, I didn't say, oh, there's a counterfeit, so I'm done with money. This is what a lot of people do. They say, uh, we ran into a counterfeit, a false prophet, or uh, somebody operating in the counterfeit gifts, tongues, whatever, counterfeit. And they ran into that, and, they, and, and bad things happened, and they got discouraged, and they said, I'm done with this whole Holy Ghost gifts thing. And that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's saying I'm done with money because I got a counterfeit $100 bill. I'm not done with money. See, you have to make up your mind, I'm going to pursue it even if there's counterfeits out there because I want to show people what the real is. And God's promised in the last days, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men are going to see visions. Your old men are going to dream dreams. He promised the last days. That's why I marvel at these preachers that say these gifts and the power and visions and miracles are not for today. I'm like, God said they're going to be happening in the last days. God said he's going to move on his people like this in the last days to operate and walk in the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they say, oh, it ceased with the apostles, or it ceased when the Bible came into being. And they finished the canon. No more gifts. Doesn't say that anywhere in here. Some of the preachers are just flat out liars. They actually know. Let me tell you what's so sad. They actually know the truth. But they went to school. And got them a nice job making a six-figure salary, the big church in their denomination. They're so respected within their denomination and Presbyterian. They're moving up the ranks. They, they say it like God. That stuff right there to me just stinks to high heaven. Because some of you, because some of them know exactly what the Word of God says, whether it be about creation or about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of tongues, or the gifts of healing and miracles. They know what it says, but they will never preach it because they know they would lose their job. They'd lose their title and position. They'd lose the praise of men that worship them, people that worship them because they're, they're, they're oh, the superintendent of the denomination. Let me, let me tell you something. In Protestant Christianity, we still have our popes. Time to get free from your popes. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Whew. I'm going to tell you right now, I felt good preaching on this today. That's a Father's Day message for you. We need fathers filled with the Holy Ghost, being led by the Holy Spirit. We need children, whether grown or small, to understand that God's put your parents in your life and you think, you think something they believe is silly or maybe you don't like something. Again, 
Respect your father and your mother, right? Obey your father and mother that you may have long life upon the earth. I want to do that song again uh, more than we did this morning. Because as we were singing that, I was like, that, that, to me, the anthem of real New Testament Christianity is, I'm not satisfied. Lord, I want more of you in my life, less of me. That song, that empty me. Oh, that was we played "Empty Me" by Jeremy Camp in the first service of this church, January eleventh, two thousand nine, and that's really kind of been the theme of our church the whole time. Clean out of me, burn out of me what you got to burn out of me, Lord, and let there be more of you in my life, so that I can walk in power. First Corinthians fourteen. I mean, First Corinthians four twenty says this. Paul told them, he said, when I came to you, I didn't come just in word only, talking words. He said, I came with power. You got to ask yourself, do I have power in my Christian life? If not, it's okay. This is not condemning you today. This is saying, get hungry and move forward and get filled and let that desire Take over your life instead of the lust of the world and chasing after the world and chasing after the things that are wickedness and sin and evil and the pleasures of this life. Seek God. Put him first. I promise he made this promise to you. He said, if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. James chapter 4. And boy, if God's near you, if he's with you, supernatural things are going to happen. And that's what people need. That's what's going to bring people to Jesus Christ in these last days. They need to see more than just words coming out of your mouth. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do this song. The anointing of the Holy Spirit's here. The presence of the Holy Spirit's here. I sense in some people this morning that that is the cry of their heart today. And the Lord said that those who were hungry and thirsty for him would be filled. That's a promise I want you to hold on to. You may say you may feel a little condemned at times or feel like I haven't lived up to my Christian walk that way I should have. Don't feel condemned. Ask God to forgive you. And then say, Lord, I want more of you. I want to be filled. I think we need to do this. I know it's Father's Day and I know some of you want to go somewhere. That's okay. Let's do this song one more time. It's short, but let, let this be the cry of your heart because I feel God working in some folks. Dealing with you to turn loose of your sin, turn loose of lukewarmness, living in that, trying to have a foot in both worlds. Some people are going to have to turn loose of their denomination that they've been in. Turn loose of the traditions of men they've learned and the doctrines of men that they've learned instead of the word of God. But I promise you, if you're hungry and thirsty for Jesus, he will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And one of the first things that's going to happen if you are hungry for the Holy Spirit, you're going to get, you're going to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's kind of the, the doorway into the rest of the gifts. You don't get to ignore tongues and say, I don't want that. It sounds foolish. You better humble yourself. Yep. Better understand that the foolishness of God is stronger than men. Amen. Amen. So let's do this one more time. Let it be the cry of your heart. It's only about five minutes. Let's do it one more time. Just keep something playing for a minute. We're going to do something here real quick. The first thing is the Lord gave me a word, and this is for possibly somebody out there listening, but for somebody in here. But I saw the Lord saw somebody that's like pride and resistance to what I'm talking about this morning. Even kind of a mocking spirit, like in a person. And this was, I know it was for more than one person, but I saw a person standing there, which is kind of a mocking spirit thinking, you know, ah, this is silly. This is stupid. And what the Lord showed me about you is he's about to take an ax to you like a tree. And he's about to chop you down. I saw axe go down to around the ankles, like chopping a tree down. The Lord said, He's going to humble you. 
Now, he could just walk away from you. But he's going to chop you down like he did Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he said, it will be like a tree. He won't chop you down. It'll be a stump left. He had to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Because Nebuchadnezzar walked around and thought, you know, look what I've done. Look at me. I can do, I don't need, I don't need God. I don't need, I don't need the Holy Spirit. I don't need what Pastor Dean's talking about. No, I'm going to tell you what God's, God's going to do. If you heard this message today and you got that attitude, the ax is coming to the root of your tree. He's going to cut you down. Everything you try to do is going to, going to come to nothing. You're going to start failing. You're going to start tripping over yourself. Everything's going to start going wrong. Because God is doing this in his mercy to get your attention. But he wanted me to tell you so you know it was him. And boy, I can tell you, when God starts opposing you, because he said he opposes the proud. When God starts fighting against you, you're not winning. He will chop you down. There's men that had all the money and the big jobs and thought they were something. And their wives go to church and they mock their wives. It's funny when God starts chopping them down. They lose the job. They lose all the money. They get sick. God steps back and just lets, lets the devil have them. Go ahead. To humble them. So somebody is going to get a humbling. But you better thank God for it because he could just walk away from you and let you be deceived in your pride. But he's going to humble you. Now, before we leave here today, some of you men out there, I, my, my wife said she just felt real strongly from the Lord that there were some of you men that just needed a quick prayer of you. Just say, I, I want to be the man of God or the father or the husband that, that you want me to be, and I'm not being that. And I want just... Just pray that God touch you before we leave. We're not going to spend a lot of time. Just going to lay hands on you and pray. God to give you strength to fill you and lead you and help you on this journey of being on fire. So if you need prayer this morning, I want you to step up here and we'll pray for you real quick. See, it's this. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I'm not trying to leave you women out. And if you need prayer, just feel like you need to be refreshed, you can come on up too. But I just feel like, I know, look, look, women, you know, y'all think that, you know, especially the ones in our lives that see our struggles and weaknesses and everything, it's easy to start losing respect. But just let me go and tell you, it ain't that easy to be a man in this world. Manhood's hated. Trying to make a living out there in the devil's world. Fighting everything that comes against you. It ain't easy. It ain't easy being a husband. And it's not easy trying to be a father. With stubborn, hard-headed children. I know. So, I commend you for saying, I want prayer for strength. So, we're going to pray for these that have come up here. And you can turn that up a little bit. We're just going to pray. Just ask God to bless you and strengthen you, okay? Lord, I just pray for my brother right here, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in his life. The anointing, the calling, the gifts upon his life, Lord. And Lord, even, you got even more for this young man, Lord. You got more for him, and I'm thankful for him. And I ask you, Lord, to bless him today and fill him today. Give him that fire. Give him that fire and that anointing, Lord, to hate sin, to hate the things in this world that tries to get his attention and pull him away from you, Lord. Give him strength to be the man of God that you've called him to be so that he can flow and walk in the power that you have for him. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, strengthen and fill my brother, Lord. I pray this right now for my brother, Greg, Lord, in Jesus' name. Fire, Holy Ghost, fill him. Oh, Lord God, strengthen him. Lead him and guide him in your will and your plan. I just pray more, Lord. You know, brother, the Lord wants me to tell you that he's going to give you the desires of your heart. He's going to give you 
the power and infilling of the Holy Spirit you love, but he also showed me that he's going to bring that woman into your life that's going to be your wife. Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, for the Eddie. I thank you, God, so much. Lord, I thank you. I know that you're doing a new thing in, in his life. There's fresh fire. There's fresh anointing there. There's fresh hunger. You know, the Lord shows me. I don't know what it is, brother. I don't know really much about your past. But the Lord tells me he's healing a wound in there that's been there. A big, a big, dark, deep wound that cuts all the way down from like your neck all the way down. I just see it was like a deep, dark wound. He says he's healing that. And the Lord wants me to tell you you're going to walk in the power of the Holy Ghost like you have never even dreamed of. That this is the beginning of a new day. New glory. New power. New miracles. Your hands will heal the sick. And the gift of the work and the miracles would happen through your hands. And you're going to lead people to Jesus. For the Lord's given you wisdom. Wisdom that many haven't seen yet, but there's wisdom in you from Him. I need you more. I need you more. The Lord says, You are the man of God I that I called you to be, and you will do great things for me, says the Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, Patrick, the Lord tells me, He tells me that you've turned the corner on a battle and a struggle that's been in your life for a long time. And the Lord shows me that you've seen the light at the end of the tunnel and you know you're coming out of it. And the devil's tried to lie to you and tell you you're not going to make it and you're not going to ever be free. You're not ever going to be the man that you feel like God's called you to be. But I'm here to tell you right now, you're going to be the man of God he's called you to be walking in holiness and peace and joy and freedom and healthy and strong the Lord's going to use you brother he's going to flow through you in great and mighty ways and I'm going to tell you right now I sensed that even in these last few weeks that there's been a change deep inside of you I know there's times you felt like giving up and that's okay. We have to be tested sometimes to the brink of falling away. But you proved that you would just stay hanging on to him, that you would hang on to Jesus. And he's going to honor that faith that you hung on through the dark time. In Jesus' name. Turn it down. Lord, I thank you for Sal. You know, I feel the same thing, Sal. You went through a time of struggle and testing. And you fought through it. And you didn't run away. And you didn't fall away. And you're being a man of God to lead your family. And he's blessed you with a godly wife who prays and operates in the gifts of the Spirit. You operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And you've only begun to see just the little trickle of what the Lord's going to do in your life. The power of the Holy Ghost is going to flow through you beyond what you could ever even ask or think. I hear the dead will be raised. The crippled will walk. The deaf will hear. The blind will see. You will see great miracles. Jesus, as you stay faithful. Lord, thank you for my brother Noah. Lord, I pray it's tough being a father in this world. Being a father and a husband, it's a battle. The devil tried to knock us down because he knows if he takes out the shepherd, if he smites the shepherd of the family, the sheep will be scattered. They'll be hurt. They'll be vulnerable to the wolves and the, the lions and the bears. You're a faithful man. And the Lord says to me to tell you he's going to give you the desires of your heart in the spiritual realm. To flow 
and discernment, a hearing ear. You're going to discern the wolves in sheep's clothing. You're going to lead people to Jesus. And you're going to be a shield and a fortress for your wife and your children. Jesus, mighty name. Father, I thank you for Bob and Lord. God, I thank you for the humility, the hunger, the power, the, the boldness that this man has to stand firm and strong for your word, God, what your word says, what he knows is truth for his beliefs in your word. You're going to honor that, God, in so many ways. You already have, Lord, which is bringing, bringing him and his wife into unity. And, Lord, a ministry together, you're going to use them to cast out demons and heal the sick and do miracles for you. Because he has that hunger. And he believes your word. And he wants to walk fully in obedience to your word. You're going to honor that, Lord. You're going to honor that in his life. Brother, it's like the story you told me the other day of somebody in your office coming to your office and just as just confessing and talking and knowing they need prayer and they need help. People are going to be drawn to you. You're going to be walking down the street. You're going to be at a restaurant. People are going to come up and say, just start talking to you. About it. It's like, like they just got to tell you everything. And you're to pray for them. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I feel the same thing, Lord Jordan, for you that I felt for Patrick, that you've turned the corner. There's been some struggles in your life, some dark times, and that you have chosen to hang on, to persevere, to press through, to not be discouraged and defeated, but to keep moving forward. And the Lord's honoring that, and the Lord's blessing that in you, and he's going to give you the freedom and the peace and the healing and the strength and the anointing and the power that you hunger for. He's going to give you everything that you desire in him. And I do feel to tell you the Lord will bring the woman that's supposed to be in your life as well. But let him bring her. You don't force it. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Is there anybody else before we go up wanting to prayer? I'm telling you. I, 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 if you want one thing I feel from the Holy Spirit strong, and it's not just for you men that came forward, but for everybody, it is there, the glory and the power and the presence and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it is there for your taking to operate in, to flow in. It is up to you. But I believe now, and I felt this for, for some time now, that a new season was coming. We went through, the church actually in America especially, went through kind of a struggle for a while. Of like the supernatural was just not happening much in true churches that were hungry for it. And the Lord's saying, you persevered through the pruning time. Now I'm going to give you the fruitful time. Amen. And that's, what, that's why it's so important when you're going through a tough period, even if that tough period lasts years, you hang on to Jesus. You keep praying. You keep refusing to fall away and give up. There's a reward for that. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, it takes any, any man, I'm going to tell you something right now. Now, not, not again, any man that perseveres through what he has to go through to be a man of God with everything. You know, men, our, our, our struggle is what the world puts in our face every day, and it's lust. It can be lust, sexual lust. It can be lust for money and power. But they put it in our face every day. The pressure of the world is on you every day to, to be that worldly man. And when you decide, I'm not going to be that way. I'm going to be a man of God. I'm going to be a strong man. I'm going to be a man that lives holy. I'm going to be a man that lives different than that world. God rewards that. Sometimes you got to hang on. Just hang on. But some of you, I know you've been hanging on and fighting through it all. You know, I don't say it much, but, you know, Patrick and Sheree lost a baby. Miscarriage. And they were devastated by that. 
But they didn't give up on God. They didn't turn on God when they didn't get the miracle. They hung on. And look what y'all got sitting over there. <laughs> but see, sometimes we go through the fire. But see, now I'm telling you, you, you turn in the corner as a family, and you're going to see the power and the miracles. And everything that you long for, you're going to begin to see it. The, the, the gift of tongues interpretation, that's just a trickle. This is just the beginning. Somebody say amen. amen. I guess I'll let y'all go home. Huh? Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he, he's, he start, it's an, I can tell you, it's a new season. It's a new season for our church. It's a new season, and I believe, for the body of Christ. But you have to, it's like the, the fruit on the tree hanging there. You've got to reach out and take it. You've got to grab it. You've got to pull it off for yourself. It's there for the taking, God says. Amen. All right, y'all know the drill. Hug some necks before you leave. I know some of you got to go uh, to Father's Day activities. That's great. I want you to go do that. If you got your father's alive and you use anywhere near where you can go see him, you need to go spend time with that man if you can. But if you don't, or you need to, we, we, we're going to stay here for a little while and eat lunch. So there'll be a, a few of us still here. So if anybody needs to, wants to hang out, go get something to eat, come back and stay downstairs for a little while, uh, you're welcome to. But hug some necks before you leave and be safe out there. Amen. Bye, y'all.